thank you all for coming for our spring business speaker series, business economic speaker series. Um, today, I'm excited to welcome Professor John Hooker, who is the Holleran Professor of Business Ethics and Social Responsibility and Professor of Operations Research in the Tepper School of Business at Carnegie Mellon University. He has published over 200 articles and nine books and taught some 20 different courses in mathematical modeling, ethics, and cross-cultural issues. Um, he has lived and worked in Australia, Brazil, China, Denmark, India, Qatar, Qatar, anyway, Turkey, UK, US, and Zimbabwe. In addition to extensive experience in France, Germany, Ireland, Italy, Mexico, uh, and other work-related assignments in other countries. Um, he has received several awards for his contributions to operations research, as well as teaching awards for his cross-cultural courses at Carnegie Mellon. In addition, he's written a number of musical compositions for piano, chamber groups, and chorus. Uh, before I welcome here, uh, just uh, you can keep your phone on, si on silent mode, it would be appreciated. Uh, I also wanna thank, uh, this talk has been sponsored by the Charles Koch Foundation, and co-sponsored by the Delta Mu Delta, the IU East Center for Economic Education, and the IU East Business and Economic Research Center. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Hooker to this talk today. Okay, so thanks very much for that introduction. And hi, everyone. I think it's great that your faculty is interested in cross-cultural issues because in my view, that's more important than ever. And I'll try to explain why as I go along. So to begin with, uh, why should we care about this? Okay, uh, because business is global. Uh, just living in the US means that you're interacting with people from all over the world. You know, literally there are people living in the US who are from every country on the planet, every single one. And in fact, uh, my last course in international business, and we have about 70 some students, and they came from 35 countries and speak 25 languages fluently in one class, okay? So we have a multicultural country, a multicultural world, and the world of work is more multicultural than ever, either in person, you're interacting with people from around the world, uh, electronically on Zoom. And don't be surprised if you find yourself traveling to some country you never expected you would end up in as part of your job all the time. Understanding these cultures is an asset because you know how to get things done. It's been very useful to me to know what's going on in these other cultures and it's different out there. That's my next point. Every culture has a different thought system, a different logic that makes things work there. It's more different than we think. We in the U.S. have a universalizing culture. It's part of who we are. We tend to think that everyone's basically the same inside. Maybe they different language, different cuisine, but otherwise we're all basically the same. No, it's not true. It's different. Okay. Going to another country can be like going to another planet. And cultures are endlessly fascinating. Every tradition has its own wisdom. We can learn a great deal from the lifestyle and the perspective of other people. I certainly have. And once you become immersed in another culture and come back to the U.S., you have a different perspective on who you are. You begin to understand at a deeper level what's going on here as well. What is culture? It's not about the food. Okay, it's not the food. It's not the language even. It's not the dress. This uh, abaya here looks like, oh, at least it's a very different place. They dress differently. No, that's not what's different. That's just a modesty standard. Every culture in the world has a modesty standard. It only differs in detail. What's different is what's up in the brain, not what's on the body. It is different 
but not in the way you think. A little thought experiment I use with my Asian students. We have a number of Asian students at Carnegie Mellon. And I say, let's imagine, thought experiment, that tomorrow, all everyone in China starts eating sauerbraten and Kesespätzle, two German dishes, rather than Jiaozi and Baozi, which are staples in my son's home because his wife is Chinese. What would that do to the culture? And they're thinking, it would destroy the culture. No, it would be the very same culture. It's not what goes in the stomach that makes you who you are. It's what's in the head, in the brain, the way we think. Okay. So the old analogy of the iceberg explains it well, I think. What's on top up here is the language, you know, the, the food, you know, the customs, the dress. But what's down here is 90% of the culture. We're not even aware of it. We don't, we don't, we're not even aware of the assumptions that we make as part of who we are. Also, culture is not ethnic identity. And you know, very often ethnic groups sort of make up uh, a narrative as to who they are. I'll give you an example of that. When I first started teaching cross-cultural courses, I asked my students to divide into groups and to uh, investigate a country. They would go out and interview people from that country, which is not hard in the US because there are people here from everywhere. And one of my groups did a presentation on the Czech Republic. So their presentation consisted of a dissertation on the beer. They told us what kind of beer you can get in Czech Republic, how you drink the beer, how it's made, what kind of cup you drink it from. So later I asked them, you know, why did you just focus on the beer? And they said, well, we talked to some people, some Czechs, and they told us, to understand our culture, you have to understand the beer. This is who we are. Well, of course, that's not who they are. <laughs> a lot of countries in Northern Europe are fixated on their beer, but that's not what makes them distinct. In fact, you know, ethnic groups often sort of fabricate the story of, as to who they are once they realize they're beginning to lose their distinctive identity. It's a way of trying to restore ethnic distinctiveness. Now, a caveat. I'm not here to tell you which cultures are good or bad. Okay, I don't make judgments. I don't know which cultures are good or bad. I'm not smart enough to know that, okay? I'm only telling you they're different, very different, okay? One can describe a culture without implying any kind of judgment. It's only a description. And that's my business here. Okay. Now in the US, we're very sensitive to the idea of stereotyping individuals. Okay, we don't do that in these cultural studies. We talk about the system that people live in, not the personalities who live there. Every culture has the full range of personalities. Okay, so for example, you know, Swedes are supposed to be quiet and methodical. There are plenty of Swedes who love noisy parties. And there are plenty of Brazilians who hate them. In fact, if you're in uh, Rio during Carnival, just, you know, this time of year, uh, or in Rio de Janeiro, as they say, uh, a large fraction of the population of Rio leaves the city during Carnival because they can't stand the noise and the commotion. They like it quiet. Hey, I've had several students uh, from Brazil, yeah, from Brazil, and they're some of the quietest people I know. Okay, so every country has every personality type. What's different is the system they live in, the system they have to deal with and fit into. And of course, some people fit into their culture more readily than others do. We're talking about the system. So I like to use the analogy of weather and climate. Culture is like the climate. Personality is like the weather. Okay. So for example, suppose I say, you know, if you're going to Alaska, be sure to take a warm coat because it's cold there. And you respond, well, look, you know, I heard that at one point it was actually 100 degrees in Alaska. So you're exaggerating when you say that Alaska is cold. Well, I'm not exaggerating, just that I'm talking about the climate, the atmospheric situation, not the daily weather, okay? 
So you want to be prepared for the climate, right? You go to Alaska, take a warm coat, even though they have hot days. And you go to another country, be prepared for the, over, you know, the overarching culture, even though you'll meet people of all kinds of personalities. Okay. Now, people will often say, look, the world is homogenizing. We're all sort of moving together toward a common culture due to cheap air travel, you know, communications technology. Aren't we all sort of coming together? It may appear that way to us from our perspective, but it's not true. Okay. First of all, relatively, relatively few people in the world ever leave their home country. They can't afford it. So most people in the world grow up exclusively in their cultural environment and maintain those cultural characteristics. Okay. Now, how about information technology, TV, social media, and so forth? Let's have a look at that. Okay, television. Aren't they all watching our shows? Some do. But when I was living in the Middle East, I could get more than 400 channels on my satellite dish. Okay. All but one were Arabic language channels with Arabic content. Only one BBC News had anything to do with Western TV. They're watching their own stuff. They don't have to watch our stuff. They have their own. It's cheap to set up satellite TV. Okay, now it's true in China. A lot of people watch Korean soap operas. Yeah, yeah. There are exceptions like that. But by and large, it's easy for people to, to zero in on their own cultural content. Even Google. You say, well, Google is used all over the world. It is in most countries. Did you know that Google is actually 348 Googles? There are 348 Google sites, all with different languages, tailored to those particular cultures. So when you, you, know, you log into Google, they read your IP address. They know where you are. In fact, it's difficult to get these other Googles here in the U.S. There are tricks to it. They know where you are, and they're going to send you the Google that's appropriate for your culture. Here's a few examples. You know what these are? What's this? You see that? Croatian. Yeah. Obviously Chinese. But Suomi? Finnish. Someone said it. Yeah. Finnish. Korean. Farsi. Where is Farsi spoken? Iran, right? Yeah. But no one knows this one. Amharic. Who is that spoken? Ethiopia. Very much in the news lately for unfortunate reasons. Okay. Well, Google's all over the world. Social media. Well, look, you know, social media are notorious for dividing us into little echo chambers, our own little bubbles, right? Even here in the U.S., as we all know, we have different little subcultures all on their own social media networks. This is why we have one reason we have so much polarization. We're all hearing different facts and living in different little worlds. This is true internationally. Now, Facebook is in most countries, but it's a very different local situation on Facebook. They're all sort of you know, interacting with their own people, people who think like them. Of course, a number of these sites are not from the US. Several of them are Chinese, okay. Uh, this is Korean. Okay, this live journal is popular in Russia. How about TikTok? You see TikTok up here? There it is. TikTok is a Chinese site. Did you know that? Yeah, maybe you do that. Okay. All right. Now, just to give credit to two thinkers that are very important, what I'm about to say one is Edward Hall, the late Edward Hall, a very much admired. Uh, by me in particular, I, I really like his writings. I learned a lot from them. Also, if you take a course in cross-cultural management with your company, you'll hear a lot of, from this guy, Gerrit Hofstede, who's a Dutch uh, so sociologist. So you see some of his ideas here as well. Okay, now, relationships and rules. So there's about 5,000 cultures in the world. It's a lot. But there's a major distinction between two types, relationship-based and rule-based. So this is a very broad distinction, but it's true. It's very useful and it's very helpful to me. All right, 
So you notice I have a color code here. The red type means I'm talking about relationship-based cultures and blue is rule-based. Let me explain what this is. All right, so these are the relationship-based cultures, most of the world. So most of the world is not like us. They're different. They're relationship-based. So as you see, Asia, Middle East, Africa, Latin America, all relationship-based cultures, where life is organized around personal relationships and the loyalties they imply. Okay. Rule-based cultures are basically Europe and its cultural descendants. So Europe itself, not all of Europe, but most of it, uh, North America, except Mexico, Australia, and New Zealand. Okay. These are the countries that are more like us. Okay. Not much of the world is like us. Okay. All right, so these are countries in which life is organized, organized around the rules. What does this mean? Now, let me first say that no culture is pure. It's purely relationship-based or purely rule-based. There's always a mix. So this is captured by this ancient symbol from China, right? Yin Yang. Okay, so this means that in every distinction, there's a little of the other. So in every relationship-based culture, there's a little of a rule-based and vice versa. Okay, and every male is a little female and vice versa. And so it goes. So keep that in mind. But one tends to dominate. Okay. So first of all, there are different ways of getting things done. In relationship-based culture, you see the red color there. You work through who you know. Now, working through who you know, of course, is useful in the U.S., right? Naturally, it's easier to get a job if you know someone who can get you in there. But in most of the world, it's not only useful, it's absolutely necessary to get a job, to work through who you know. There's no, you know, you send your resume, that's meaningless. They don't want to see it. They want to know, how about your uncle? Okay, we, we know your uncle, you know, maybe he'll vouch for you. Okay. In rule-based countries, you can't send in your resume. Sometimes you can get a job or get an interview at least just based on your resume. That's possible. All right. In business, this is what we have so much trouble understanding here in the U.S. For us, business is about making deals. That's what business people do. They make a deal, negotiate a deal, draw up a contract, then they carry out the terms of that contract. And if something goes wrong, they sue them and go to court. Okay. This is what business is for us. This is not what business is in most of the world. Business is not about making deals. It's about building relationships, building relationships with business partners. The contract is secondary if there's one at all. Okay? Rather, you have a mutual understanding and personal trust, which are the heart and soul of business in most of the world. Now, there's some of that here, of course. Personal relationships are helpful, but there it's everything. All right. Even traffic illustrates what I'm talking about. This is some traffic in India. It looks chaotic to us. They know what they're doing. You go, go into the intersection, you have sort of one on one negotiation. If you're in India, you know, they sort of honk their horns a lot. And they come up behind you and honk their horns at you. Okay, in the U.S., that means get out of the way, right? I'm in a hurry. In India, it's a courtesy. It's a way of communicating with you. It's just polite. You say, just letting you know I'm behind you so we don't have an accident. Okay. So everything is different on the road because it's a relationship-based culture. Whereas in the U.S., we have this orderly system of traffic laws that except perhaps in New Jersey and Boston, but most of the country, yeah, we have traffic laws. All right. Authority is different. In relationship-based cultures, people with authority comes from people. In Saudi Arabia, I was there for a while, this guy is the authority. The royal family issues the laws. They have the laws are binding because they come from the royal family. This man and his son. Okay. In the U.S., we have this thing. Okay, This is basically the way we hang together to the extent that we do. Right? Even the president has authority, at least in theory, only to the extent this thing gives him authority. 
He must be elected according to the provisions as set out here. Now, maybe recently we had a president who didn't agree with that, but that's the system here, and it usually works that way. So here, the rules themselves are the ultimate authority, okay? And the people acquire their authority from the rules. Here, it's the opposite. You see how different it is. Okay. We're already on another planet here. Now, I'm going to show you some cultural characteristics that correlate with this relationship-based, rule-based distinction. There's three at the bottom here that don't really correlate. I'll show you those briefly as well because they're sort of interesting. Let's just go through these. The easiest one to follow is the sense of time. So this again is due to insights from Edward Hall. Okay. He distinguished cultures as monochronic and polychronic. So now you've learned two, two new words. You can impress your friends. So what does this mean? In monochronic cultures, monochronic, people do one thing at a time as a rule. That's us. We like to do one thing at a time. We want to finish one task before moving on to another. So for example, I was teaching in Hong Kong for a while, Hong Kong Polytechnic, and I'm doing joint research with one of the faculty members there. And I would go to his office and we'd work on a theorem or a proof. Well, you know, he would have an interruption about every two minutes. Someone would be on his phone, people would walk in, he'd call his wife. It was driving me crazy because I like to focus on one thing. But he would get off the phone and say, I have an idea. It helped him to think to have all this multitasking going on, whereas it drove me crazy. He lives in a polychronic culture. I live in a monochronic culture where I like to do one thing at a time. Okay. U.S. is one of the strongest examples of that in the world. Right? This talk started at 12.30 sharp. Punctuality is an important part of monochronicity. And you're hoping it's going to end on time too, right? Yeah. Very time conscious here. You know, so that the handbooks say in the U.S., you never want to be more than three minutes late. In Caracas, Venezuela, you can be 30 minutes late. Unless it's with a boss. You're never late with an appointment for the, with a the boss. Now, there are a few exceptions. Monochronic cultures tend to be punctual. But there's a few polychronic cultures like Japan and Singapore that are fairly punctual too, even China to a great extent, okay, for other reasons. Okay. In polychronic cultures, as I mentioned, people are comfortable with juggling many tasks at once, do many things at once. So I knew a guy in India who hired a company to build a house for him. It took him four or five years to build this house because it'd show up maybe once a week, one day a week. Why? because they were working on several houses at once. And they just sort of go from one to the other. So it drove this guy crazy that the guys would not show up, you know, more than a day a week. Actually, it was quite practical for them because often the materials didn't arrive when they wanted them. And if not, they could just go work on another house. So they had all these projects going at once. Punctuality tends not to be important in these countries, except appointments with the boss. You don't keep the boss waiting. We like to organize and structure our time. It actually makes us feel more secure. You know, if you go into daycare centers, you know, the kids in daycare centers are stressed out because they're away from their parents. One way that the daycare people get these kids to feel more comfortable is to structure the day. You know, you have nap time at 1030, you have lunch at 11, et cetera, et cetera. The same schedule every day. Maybe you've seen Mr. Rogers' show. He's from Pittsburgh, you know. So you know about Mr. Rogers? In every show, he would do the same thing. He would come in, take off his coat, you know, put on that sweater, put on the slippers. The same ritual every time. It's predictable. Predictability makes kids feel more comfortable. It makes adults feel more comfortable. And if we structure our time, our day is predictable. So actually, it's a stress management mechanism for us, the structuring of time and appointments and punctuality. It seems to stress us out, but ultimately, it's a stress management mechanism. We love cues. The British say that they invented the cue. They did. 
You go to UK, they just love to wait in queues. It's just part of life, part of existence. Why a queue? So that means the, the person at the head, the clerk at the desk, only has to deal with one person at a time. Rather than having customers crowd around the desk, all wanting attention at once, one at a time, because that's the way we can deal with life. We have to do one thing at a time. Now, of course, you see queues in much of the world today in airports, international hotels. This is borrowed from the Western practice because there are a lot of Western visitors you know, travel the world. But it's a Western thing. Okay. We see time as measurable. But then you can measure. You say, of course, minutes, hours, seconds. Yeah, that's the way we see it. But not much of the world. We think that if you're idle, you're wasting time, something you can waste. You know, I worry about this all the time. And we can't stand to wait, right? You got to be doing something. Get that phone out, whatever. Can't stand it. I can't stand it either. Okay. So I, I was in Zimbabwe for a while, I was teaching there. And there, the inner city buses don't have a schedule. I mean, they just come when they come. So people would go to the bus stop and just wait for the bus. That drove me absolutely nuts. I never knew when the bus was coming. You know, the local people, they were fine with it. They would just converse with their friends and neighbors and, and relax. Time had stopped until the bus came. When I came back to the U.S., you can imagine the culture shock I had, but I had to readjust to this time-conscious culture. <laughs> I got used to not having... In fact, some of my friends had watched but didn't set it. It was just jewelry. All right. They didn't set the watch. But in the U.S., you better get your watch to the minute, right? So I can quit on time, right? Okay. Travel arrangements similar. Uh, when I was living in Denmark, uh, we, uh, we made arrangements to go to Norway for a holiday. We booked passage on uh, a ferry. So I booked it, you know, three months in advance and in March to make a passage in July. And I got the, the confirmation and it said I had booked the passage for a year from July. So I called them up and said, there's been a mistake. And they said, no, don't you know that everyone books at least a year in advance? And this part of the world is very monochronic and everything is booked in advance. So if you go to Oslo, book your hotel a year in advance. Polychronic culture is just like this. People will be crowding around the desk and the clerk dealing with many people at once. This is shown as a sign, of, this is seen as a sign of courtesy, actually, because you, 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 know, you give attention to everyone as soon as possible. Okay. So let's push ahead to uh, power distance. Okay. There's different sense of power. Power distance is the degree to which people accept being in a subordinate position okay here in the u.s we don't do this right we no one wants to be in a subordinate position but in much of the world this is seen as just natural a natural part of of life so uh in relationship-based cultures we have high power distance people people have authority good example is Deng xiaoping sort of the ideal confucian leader he was authoritarian but he also cared about the people. In fact, as much, he's greatly responsible for the economic boom that occurred in China, you know, the, the growth rate we've seen in the last 20, 30 years. Okay. And low power distance countries like uh, Sweden, for example, it's very different. So there's an interesting story about King uh, Carl Gustav. He would just walk the streets like a regular guy. And one year he went uh, Christmas shopping. So he went into the store, bought a few items, went up to the checkout and gave him a credit card. And they asked for his ID. And he said, well, I don't carry an ID. I said, why not? Because I'm the king. King doesn't carry an ID. Well, I'm sorry, I can't honor your credit card. So finally they resolved it when the, he asked the clerk to open the cash drawer, pull out a one krona piece, a coin, and said, you see that picture? That's me. Okay. High power distance countries, kids actually obey their parents. Can you imagine it? Or else. Okay. 
and the boss is authoritarian, but the boss is supposed to care about his workers. Low power distance countries, kids can contradict their parents, okay? Management is different. We believe in consultative management. You can bring up problems about the company. You can, you know, disagree with the boss. Okay. You don't do that in relationship based countries. That correlates with shame and guilt based cultures. Okay. Relationship based cultures are based on shame as a means of enforcing behavior. We are based primarily on guilt here. So there are countries like Japan where there is no concept of personal guilt in the sense of feeling guilty for something. It just doesn't occur. But shame is very important. Okay. Shame can take the form of loss of face, very important in Asia. Okay. Humiliation, corporal punishment, so forth. And direct supervision. If you're a manager, your workers expect you to watch them all the time. And if you don't, they will assume you don't care. Okay. This is one point that we Westerners often miss. So for example, if you take an exam in Singapore National University, there are going to be proctors walking up and down the aisles, constantly looking over your shoulder. And if they catch you cheating, you're out of there, no questions asked. You are expelled from school. You're very closely enforced. You take an exam in a U.S. school, well, you may have one proctor up at the front of the room, you know, some graduate student working on his thesis or something. And it's relatively easy to cheat here, right? Now, if you get caught, you're in trouble. But it's relatively easy because there's not much supervision. That's characteristic. Okay. So there's an old German proverb, proverb ein gutes Gewissen ist ein softes Ruhekissen. A good conscience is a soft pillow. It means that our guilt complex keeps us awake, right? We're tortured by guilt, even if no one else knows that we did it. We have this internal mechanism. This is characteristic of rule-based cultures. Self-enforcement. Okay. Even humor is different. Okay. Did you know this? We have a different kind of humor, humor in our rule-based world. Uh, we identify humor with jokes. A joke is a thing that has a punchline. Usually it's a sense of irony or breaking the rules, like you know, dirty jokes and ethnic jokes. Break the rules, sort of relief tension by letting us get away with breaking the rules, all right? And there's an irony. So this is an example from the UK, Mr. Bean, maybe you've seen his his skits. He never says much in his skits. It's all visual. So Mr. Bean drives this tiny car, okay? And well, he was waiting at this intersection and the light was red, but the, there was a walk sign. So this guy on this bicycle got off his bicycle and became a pedestrian and walked his bike across legally across the intersection because the walk sign was green. So Mr. Bean says, okay, I'll just get out of my little car and push my car across the intersection. I can't wear a bicycle and I'll be legal. Okay, that's British humor. Maybe you don't like it, but the point here is that he's sort of breaking the rules, right? It's a rule-based humor, and there's a punchline to it. So if you go to China and try to tell a joke, which I've tried, okay, they will laugh before the punchline, because there's no concept of punchline. There, you know, humor is amusement. So very often I would get on the train, go out into the hinterland just to explore, and I go into a town where they had never seen a Westerner before, never seen one of these tall guys with a big nose. And I'd walk into a shop and everyone would start giggling and carrying on to see this strange, uh, you know, exotic character because it was amusing, you know. Variety is a spice of life for them. That's why the cuisine has so many thousand dishes, variety. <laughs> All right, high and low context, also important in business. So, uh, Low context cultures, so-called, this is also from uh, Edward Hall, are cultures in which information is spelled out. What you're supposed to do is written down and spelled out for you. You don't have to rely on the social context to pick up what you're supposed to do. See, one marker is signs everywhere telling you what to do. You go to the swimming pool, there's a long list of rules what you do at the swimming pool, right? Everything is posted, okay? And we pay attention 
to the rules. So at one point I was in the transit lounge at Heathrow Airport. And of course the flight was late as they usually are in the UK. So I was waiting and waiting. So I went to the men's room and there was a sign on the men's room door that said, men's room out of order, please use the other men's room. So I went to the other men's room. But I came back and then I watched people go up to this door, okay? And you know, I could tell where people are from, right? You can always tell where they're from. You know, by the way, you, you can always tell Americans, right? Americans sort of have this innocent look, open-faced, friendly look about them. You can always tell where they're from. So I was watching people go up to this door and everyone from a rule-based country, okay, would read the sign and go to the other restroom. Every single person from a relationship-based country would ignore the sign and walk in. <laughs> Watch it, okay. They would walk in, yeah. Because they're not trained to live in this world of instructions. They are trained to live in a world of personal supervision, not written instructions. So in your company, you know, you can, you can send around a memo, it's not gonna make any difference. You can put a no smoking sign on the wall and it's not gonna make any difference. They expect to be told what they're supposed to do through personal relationship, they're supposed to obtain the information from the social context, not from written instructions. So if you're managing in the Middle East or anywhere else in the relationship-based world, keep that in mind. Okay. Low context cultures, you can openly discuss and even disagree with the boss, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, you can openly discuss issues and it's okay to say no. Say, I don't like your offer, it's all right. In high context cultures, communication is indirect body language. You sort of beat around the bush. You don't disagree with the boss. You don't criticize company policy in front of the boss. For one thing, the boss will lose face and therefore lose authority. All right. And what I call the first rule of international business, in low context countries, nothing is agreed upon unless it's in the contract. So you can sit around the dinner table in a restaurant and say, well, let's do this. Let's do that. But next morning, if it's not in the contract, it's all off the record. It's just though it never happened. And everyone understands this in business. It doesn't matter unless it's in the contract. But if you're in most of the world, so you're in China, you have to sit around the dinner table, right, in the restaurant and say, let's do this, let's do that. And what you write in the contract is incidental, if, even if there is a contract. Just putting something in the contract is meaningless. You have to have a personal understanding. It has to be part of the trust relationship. So nothing is agreed upon unless it's part of the relationship. This is probably the greatest single stumbling block for us Americans when we do business around the world. We don't realize this. Now, one final one in these uh, two categories is collectivist and individualist. All right. In collectivist cultures, your primary loyalty is to some group. So people in China will say your first loyalty is to your children. Your second loyalty is to your parents, grandparents, and ancestors. Your third loyalty is to yourself. Okay. Of course, here is the reverse, right? It's, it's me. I'm number one. All right. And there's a focus on cooperation. And people rely on their family or their group for support. Now, this focus on cooperation is also foreign to us because our whole society is organized around competition. We believe in competition. It's an article of faith for us. So when I was teaching in, Zim in, in, in Zimbabwe, for example, I was teaching operations management. So when I asked the students to divide in groups and make a presentation, go out and study some business or operation and make a presentation on it. So somehow they picked up from me this competitive worldview, right? So one of the groups thought, we're gonna be the best in the class. We're gonna get an A plus on this assignment. So they went to the Mutari post office, the local post office, studied it very carefully and came in early in the classroom and they mocked up the classroom to look like the post office so they could demonstrate everything the post office was doing. And it was really impressive. Then the other students came in and you should have seen the frowns, okay? So finally, before this group got started on this presentation, they apologized to the class for being so good. 
I couldn't imagine that at Carnegie Mellon, a <laughs> very competitive place. They apologize for being better than the other guys because you're supposed to help each other, cooperate, support each other. In this culture, this is the Shona culture in Zimbabwe, not, God forbid, not compete with your classmates. Oh, that's inhuman. Okay, that's how different it is. All right. As I mentioned here, your primary loyalty is yourself and you're responsible for yourself. You know, if you fail, it's your own fault. Get out there and take initiative. Okay. We even blame ourselves for our illnesses. You know, if you get cancer, well, it's because you were smoking or you didn't have the right diet or whatever. We blame, we feel guilty about our illnesses. Didn't have the right lifestyle. Most of the world, if you get sick, it's fate. It's the gods or the devil or something like this. I have a Latin American friend and you know, he missed a flight, okay? Of course, when we miss a flight, we say that. I missed the flight. He didn't say that. He said, the flight left without me, right? So we blame it on ourselves. We have this guilt. I missed the flight. It's my fault. He didn't. He says, it left without me. It's not my fault. Okay. When, when you're traveling around the world, listen for little things like that. You can learn a lot by being observant for the little things. Okay. Now, just to two or three uh, to wrap it up here. Masculine and feminine. This is Hofstadter's distinction. Now, let's try to set aside all our political connotations of masculine and feminine, okay, and so forth, and try to understand what he's saying. There are two ways to understand this distinction between types of cultures. It doesn't necessarily correlate with, with relationship rule-based. Okay. One is masculine values. There are some cultures, masculine cultures, in which men are expected to be tough, like this sumo wrestler. Okay. And Japan, according to Hoff's data, is the number one masculine culture in the world, top of the list. Okay. Men and women are very different there. Yeah, men are expected to be men, and women are expected to be women. Very different. In feminine cultures, men and women are more similar, almost the same sometimes, as in Scandinavia. Highly yeah. distinguishable. The other way to interpret this is an attitude toward competition, again. Okay? Masculine cultures value competition. So, for example, in the U.S., we have antitrust laws, which get in the way of competition. In Latin America, there are very weak laws of this kind, if any. So there's no problem with being anti-competitive, anti at least not nearly to the same degree. Okay. In feminine cultures, cooperation is important. All right. So this is a, sort of a, a sampling of some few countries on these two dimensions. So these countries up here are masculine in both senses. Men are tough, see we're there, and competition is valued. The US, UK, Ireland, Philippines, India, masculine in both senses, okay? Uh, these countries over here in the green are feminine in both senses. Cooperation is valued and men and women are about the same. Okay, these countries over here are feminine in one sense and masculine in the other. So they're non-competitive, but men are different. And a good example is machismo cultures. That's in Latin America or in Northern Africa, Southern Europe. I won't talk about that today, but that's a very interesting uh, case of this. Okay. <clears throat> a couple of case studies, Scandinavia. Here, men and women are hardly distinguishable. I mentioned that. Emphasize cooperation, okay? So the union and management, they have union, you know, labor movement, uh, but they have, you know, union members on the board of directors. And the rule is you cooperate, okay? You come together. In the US, negotiation, you know, if you're negotiating a contract, is like a poker game. You know, you're out to get them. You're out to win. In Scandinavia, you want to negotiate there in a very different way. You put all your cards on the table. Okay, and you find a mutually acceptable arrangement where everyone knows what's beneficial for the other side and try to accommodate both sides transparently. 
All right, this is in Northern Europe, very different approach. Tyrant is in most senses a uh, feminine culture. One sort of obvious way is the, the acceptance of transgender. You know, it's becoming somewhat acceptable in the US now, but they're way ahead of us. They have these toys, which are sort of like a uh, third gender, you know, often men who have feminine characteristics are been through sex change operations and so forth. That's been going on in Thailand for decades. Okay. Uh, also, the uh, political violence you know, typically, is typically nonviolent. So this is a, a coup that occurred in 2006. I actually knew a man who was involved in this. Notice that they brought the soldier roses. You know, someone on the street brought roses to the soldier, sort of, you know, uh, a coup Thai style. Although in, there have been some exceptions, so cultures are complicated. There was an uprising in 2010 where there was real violence in Thailand. And so feminine cultures do tend to have this sort of, you know, porous boundary between men and women. Okay, so you tend to see that. Maybe the US culture is becoming more feminine, at least in some subcultures, perhaps so. But overall, no. Okay. <clears throat> There is uncertainty tolerance and uncertainty avoidance. This is also a Hofstede distinction. This is how people deal with uncertainty. So uncertainty tolerant cultures are willing to take risks. They're willing to travel all over the world, relocate, they're entrepreneurial in business and so forth. Okay, uncertainty avoiding cultures, they tend to stick with familiar surroundings, stay around their family, risk averse in business. And you often see a great deal of bureaucracy because bureaucracy is a, is a comforting uh, tradition. It's sort of like ritual in the church. You know, it's, you go through these same rituals every time. These are some uncertainty avoiding cultures. According to Hofstede, Greece is number one, okay, Latin America. Okay. okay. Some uncertainty tolerant cultures, the UK. So actually, uh, we'll look at the UK in a moment. US, uncertainly, because it's a land of immigrants, right? People took a risk to come here. So they're used to taking risks. We're used to, used to it. Hong Kong, very entrepreneurial, coastal Chinese, Cantonese-speaking Chinese, very entrepreneurial people and very rich these days. Okay, Singapore and so forth. So UK is a case study here. Masculine culture, right? So in this uh, Ukrainian conflict, Who's the most gung-ho country in the world on the Ukrainian side, except for Ukraine itself? The UK, right? Prime Minister is making all these statements about how they got to defeat Russia. Uh, militaristic, stiff upper lip, you know, tough and competitive. This is where we get our competitiveness from the UK here in the US. Also uncertainty tolerant. Brits love to travel. You know, as soon as you retire, you're traveling the world. You don't care where you go, you go anywhere. These old couples are going everywhere. Okay. I don't worry about COVID. You just go. Uh, in fact, you know, the former British colonies tend to be more livable because the British were willing to live there in their own colonies. That wasn't true of most colonies. Okay, only a few adventurous people would live there, go there. But the Brits, you know, settled in their own colonies. And as a result, they built the infrastructure and made the place, and rather than destroy the place, they actually built the place up. India is a complicated example of that, but there are other, you know, for Zimbabwe, for example, is a place where the British uh, occupied and actually built the infrastructure and made the country, you know, quite a nice place to live. <clears throat> okay. And finally, uh, there's a distinction between Dionysian and Apollonian, a couple of terms you may not have heard before. This is due ultimately to Friedrich Nietzsche, the philosopher, wrote a famous book about this. And it was picked up by Ruth Benedict, anthropologist. She wrote a book many years ago, which is still worth reading today, Patterns of Culture, all right? And she contrasted the lifestyle of two types of native peoples in North America, the Pueblo and the Plains Indians, such as the Mandan, which really no longer exist. So the Pueblo people traditionally are very, you know, you know sort of orderly, you know, a quiet uh, approach to life. Everything's under control. Whereas the Mandan people are very emotional and intense in their feelings. They use drugs and so forth. Okay, and if, they, if there's a death in the family, you know, they'll wail and scream, you know, for weeks on end. Yeah, this is two ways of handling life, handling stress and grief and pressure, uncertainty.
Okay, so here's an example. This is a funeral on the left in Norway. Everyone sort of dresses in black, very quiet, very orderly. On the right of the funeral in Palestine, you know, people express their grief in the opposite way by letting it all out, wailing, screaming. Just two different ways of dealing with life. Okay. What are some Dionysian countries? Russia. Dionysian culture, very intense. Okay. Intense feelings. When they have a revolution in Russia, everything is torn apart. Okay. A Dionysian, an Apollonian culture might be, you know, Scandinavia. Korea versus China. Korea, Dionysian. Very intense. Chinese, more Apollonian. Okay. All right. So that's what I have to say. And I hope you have some reactions or comments. And this is my conclusion. Cross-cultural understanding is more important than ever. So the floor is open. We have a few minutes for questions. If you have questions, raise your hand. I'll bring the mic to you. Yeah, uh, well, China is not the clearest case in the world of an Apollonian culture, but, you know, Chinese history being very long and complicated, I would say it is an enduring trait on the whole of Chinese culture, okay? And of course, China has had periods of unrest, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the warring factions period and so forth, but uh, they recover from that and restore order. So there is a desire for order, and we see it today in China. Okay, so when COVID hits China, people want an orderly way of taking care of this, right? They want rules. They want the government to enforce these rules and everyone's gonna wear a mask and get the vaccine and stay home. This is the way they prefer it, an orderly way of dealing with life and, and, and stress. Yeah. Sorry. Um. I guess, can I hold it? Okay. Um, you had mentioned the distinction between relation-based and rule-based um, uh -huh. cultures, and you pointed out Europe as um, an example of kind of the rule-based mm -hmm. part of the world. Yeah. Um, historically, would you say that there was a time in which Europe was relation-based? And if so, why did that change? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, first of all, cultures do evolve. Absolutely. Cultures are not static. They're evolving all the time. And this is true of Western culture. So Western culture has been evolving toward a rule-based uh, you know, system over centuries. And it's really only flourished in the 20th century. It really came, came, came you know, bore fruit in the 20th century. It began more or less with the Romans, right? The, the system of laws, which we still subscribe to. We get this from the Romans, okay? But still, the culture in Rome was more or less relationship-based culture, okay, for the most part. And then they had another surge during the Renaissance, Okay, sort of a, a more into rule, rule-based life in the Hanseatic League and Central Europe and so forth. And then came the 19th and 20th centuries, industrialization, which tended to emphasize and allow this rule-based uh, core to flourish more and to, and, and to grow and flower. So I think it's always been sort of part of Western culture, also the Middle Eastern as you know, the Middle Eastern influence on, on Western, you know, the, uh, the Jewish law and things of this kind were also an impetus. The Greek emphasis on rationality and science sort of combined and planted the seed for that, but it took many centuries for it to flourish. And only in the last maybe 100, 200 years has it really uh, become obvious in Western, in the western part of the world. I had a question. Uh, if you did something wrong in your culture, 
like you broke a rule or in a relationship culture, you, you know, you did something, to, you know, you broke off your relationship with your parents or something like that. Right? How does one get right in both situations? Okay, in, in relationship-based cultures, the, the issue there is that you may disrupt a relationship. That's the danger. You may cause someone to lose face. You may cause someone to lose trust in you. So it's not the, so much the issue of breaking a rule, it's the issue of endangering a relationship. So how do you correct this? Well, the same way that we more or less try to mend our relationships. You apologize. You do something to compensate. You try to make up to people. Now, sometimes the break is so, so bad, you cannot. You know, you, it's gone. It's just, you may have to resign from the company or whatever. But uh, if it's not too serious, you try to mend the relationship. Now, rule-based countries, what do you do? You have to pay for your crime, right? We have punishment, we have fines, you know, you have restitution, things of this kind, you, 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 you avenge the, uh, the state, you know, is avenged for your crimes. This is the theory behind our, our, our criminal justice system. Yeah, so that's, I think that's the main, the main difference. No more questions? <laughs> well, we have one back here. Oh, one back. Does America have its own culture? Absolutely. Absolutely. We have a very, a very distinct culture here in the U.S. It's very strongly rule-based, okay? And it's the way we integrate uh, immigrants, okay? Because when you come to the U.S., people make clear to you what the rules are, okay? You can go online and look up the rules, you know, the laws. We live by the laws and the rules. So it's relatively easy to assimilate to the U.S. This is part of who we are. Okay. Well, also, as I mentioned, universalists, we believe that everyone's the same because we believe everyone should live by the rules. Okay. We think we should have transparency in a market system all over the world. We work for this. We send people out, you know, to try to convince the rest of the world to be like us. Okay. We send out missionaries to convince people to, to think like us. Okay. Because we live by the rules, our rules must be based on logic. Otherwise, we don't, we can't respect them. They must be universal. They must be inherently reasonable and convincing. So we believe that rules by their very nature are universal. And since everyone should obey the rules, everyone should subscribe to the same logic, the same worldview. This is what makes rules possible. And that's very distinctive of our culture, this universalism. To some extent, some of the European cultures as well, but it's very strong here in the US. So you wouldn't think of that initially, right? You think, well, it's U.S. culture, well, McDonald's, something like this. Well, that's a little piece of it, but that's, you know, that's the main part. And the other core part is the extreme individualism we have in the U.S., right? Everyone is responsible for himself. You know, you go out there on your own initiative. If you fail, it's your own fault. So this extreme individualism is also very U.S., okay? So where do we get that? We get partly from the UK, also from the Scotch-Irish subculture. Very important factor in the US, which we rarely talk about. We have a very strong subculture in the US. It's based on the, the in, intense individualism, the intense anti-government attitude that we inherited from the Ulster Scots, who ultimately came from Southern Scotland. Okay, that caught on on the frontier. It was just a perfect cultural uh, approach to frontier life. And it became very much part of the U.S. So this is the major source of our intense individualism. You see it in played out in our political sphere today. Okay, this is our culture. On the other hand, we also have a, a rule-based component, which is we ought to have all these COVID rules, right? And we should have lockdowns and masks. That's the rule-based side of our culture, which we get from Northern Europe. Okay, so this is who we are in the U.S. It's not obvious to us at, right, at first, right? But we have a very distinctive culture here. Also, this sort of friendliness, right? You can call everyone by the first name, okay? Uh, you can sort of smile at strangers. You know, in Europe, you know, if you're a woman in Europe and you go smile at a stranger, 
I think you want to sleep with them. Okay, don't do it. Okay, yeah. So in the U.S., you know, we sort of have this openness because we believe everyone's the same, and we're all sort of the same inside. So you can just sort of treat people like you've known them your whole life. And friendship doesn't mean much in the U.S. You know, you have Facebook friends. You know, it's meaningless. In Germany, a friend, ein Freund, that means something. You know, it means a commitment. So it's very different, even in, from Europe. And of course, in Asia, you know, friendship can imply a lifelong commitment. And this much of society is based on what's called guanxi. In China, for example, it's a friendship relation, type of friendship. Same is true in Latin America. In the Middle East, you have a kind of a brotherhood among men. You know, it's a strong commitment. We don't have that here in the U.S. This is part of who we are, too. So, yeah, U.S. has a very distinctive culture. Even though we have many subcultures, there's an overarching culture that, that helps us to hang together here. Uh, Dr. Hooker said that he will stick around if you want to ask questions in private after the talk. 